Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Elixir Kitchen class uh, this afternoon. Um, we have a very special guest today. Um, first, I'm going to join my partner in crime, or I will introduce my partner in crime. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Capone. Uh, I'm the wellness chef for the Cancer Rehabilitation Survivorship Program. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very exciting class. Um, and I'm going to throw it back to Steph because we got a lot for you. <laughs> so uh, it's Head and Neck uh, Cancer Awareness Month, and we have a very special guest, uh, registered dietitian. I'll let her introduce herself and uh, flow into our uh, program today. Okay, thanks, Steph and Jeremy, for having me. So I'm Michelle, and I'm a dietitian in the Head and Neck Cancer Survivorship Pro Program at Princess Margaret Hospital. And so today, uh, because April is Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month, we wanted to share a cooking class that can address some of the specific dietary needs that are commonly experienced by individuals undergoing treatment for this. So head and neck cancers include cancers of the mouth, the nose and the throat, and it can be common for individuals with head and neck cancer to experience difficulties with chewing and swallowing. So when it's difficult to chew and swallow, we have to change the textures of the foods in order to help make uh, swallowing safer. And when someone is not swallowing properly, it can be serious as food and drink can go down the wrong way into the lungs and cause some issues with infection. So that's why we're gonna teach you today how to safely make these uh, different texture foods. So I'll let Jeremy take it away to start. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so thanks Michelle for joining us today. Um, we're going to be going through three recipes today like we usually do, um, but what's going to be a little bit different is we're going to show you how to prepare them uh, for a regular texture as you would normally serve, but then we're also going to show you how to modify that uh, for a mince texture and a puree texture uh, like Michelle mentioned. So there's going to be a lot of technique here, um, but um, like always, if you have any questions for Michelle, for Stephanie, or for myself, you can use the chat box uh, in the uh, little YouTube screen there. Okay, so for the first recipe, we're gonna be making a salmon dish, a fish dish, um, and the cooking technique is uh, in papillote. This is a technique that we love to do all the time, um, and it's essentially cooking in paper, okay? Uh, we're not using normal paper, we're using parchment paper. Um, but what this is going to do is, it's going to be a very gentle way to cook the ingredients, um, and because we're baking it, it ensures that we're not going to get any browning on the outside, which would be problematic if we're trying to make a puree with it afterwards. Okay, so we love this technique um, and it just works really well for this puree and mince texture also. I'm going to bring you down to my cutting board. Uh, we're going to keep this fairly simple, but uh, the most important piece here obviously is the parchment paper. Okay, and we're going to take a large piece like this and we're going to fold it in half. And then we're going to add our ingredients just to the bottom half of the parchment here, okay? And for the ingredients today, we want to, you know, if, if we're going to be using this to mince and puree afterwards, we want to choose ingredients um, that will puree and mince pretty well. So what I chose here are some carrots. Now, these are just regular uh, canned carrots. These are canned, softened carrots. You can use frozen carrots as well. Um, but what I like about this is like they're already pretty soft. So you don't have to stress too much about am I, you know, cooking it enough in the oven. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but I'm like pressing it between my finger. It's really, really nice and soft. So I know that, you know, even if I, I'm undercooking it slightly, it's going to be still very, very soft. I mean, it's going to puree really easily. Okay. I'm also oh, adding oh. some roasted peppers to there as well. It's the also yeah, sorry. Very important to mention that also, um, even if you're using canned or frozen vegetables, you're still getting similar amount of vitamins and uh, nutrients from them. A lot of times people are unsure if they're going to get the same amount of nutrients. So it's okay if you're using canned and frozen. And if you're worried about salt content, you can try and choose the canned vegetables with uh, lower salt added to them. Beautiful. And so I'm keeping it very simple. I'm just adding a little bit of olive oil, um, but you can... You know, you can add a little bit of salt and pepper too, for sure. Um, if if we're going to be adding seasonings, the thing I would keep in mind is not to add anything like dried herbs or anything that won't puree really well. So I would choose things that are ground and powdered. Uh, so like powdered garlic powder, onion powder would be great. Um, 
You can, you know, uh, use like cumin powder, but any of the whole seeds or like oregano, dried oregano or dried thyme, that's going to have a really challenging time sort of pureeing. Uh, so those ones I would avoid. And then really quickly on these roasted peppers, um, these are the whole roasted peppers that you can find in the jar. I was looking in the fridge. I don't have it, but they're whole roasted peppers you can find in the jar. So the skins are removed, the seeds are removed, which is important. But also the treating of it is going to be different from any jarred vegetables that are already diced or chopped. Okay, so if you find peppers that are already pre-chopped or like sliced or same thing goes with like tomatoes, diced tomatoes, they treat them with an additive that um, sort of helps them to keep their shape, which is good if you're, I guess you're using it in a salsa or chili. But in the case where we want to cook it down so that it's soft enough to puree, that's going to be a problem. Um, it's very hard to puree them because of that additive. So if you're using tomatoes, use whole tomatoes, uh, the canned whole tomatoes. Uh, and if you're using roasted peppers, use the whole version of it as well because they don't have that additive. Okay, so we have our fish. We're going to add – sorry, we have our veg. We're going to add our fish. So this is just a piece of uh, fatty steelhead trout here, which is just got has a nice – a lot more fat, which is going to just cook a lot better going to stay a lot more juicy in there and same thing with this we can add a little bit of olive oil we can add a little bit of salt um, I'm going to add a little bit of lemon juice the lemon juice is optional um, because I, I guess Michelle sometimes lemon juice or any acid could be a problem for some head and neck patients right yeah so it's really individualized some people can tolerate cooking with some lemon or lime and other citrus but if you find it's irritating to the mouth or you have mouth sores then it might be something you want to avoid and instead seasoning with things like garlic powder or things that are a bit more mild and i also really like the addition of the oil jeremy because when our mouth is dry it's really good to kind of add some oil to the food or when you're cooking your meats to add a little bit of extra moisture but since the fish is also a higher fat, it's good. It's going to hold on to that moisture as well. Yeah, perfect. And so in the case, if you're not going to use lemon juice, just add even like a tablespoon of water or stock. Um, we just need a little bit of liquid in there to help sort of steam all the ingredients. Um, okay, so that's it. Pretty simple. Now to package it up, I'm going to take the top lid. It's going to go on top. And then we're going to just fold the edges. And I start from the back corner here. And I'm just going to fold it in just until it hits our ingredients. Take half of that and fold that in, half of that and fold that in. And so I'm just sort of creating this little crimping motion. It seems a lot harder than it is. Like really, you just you just want to create a seal. Um, and you can do this with aluminum foil. Um, if you want, it works the same way. Uh, but just sometimes, you know, we get feedback from patients that uh, you can get the metallic taste uh, off of the aluminum foil. So that's usually why we go with the parchment. All right, so we're just crimping it all the way to the end. And then with that last piece, we fold under and just kind of pinch it. Okay, and what we have here is this really nice little food package, and that's ready for the oven. Uh, so this is going to go in 375 uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, general rule of thumb for fish is 10 to 15 minutes for every inch thickness on there. Okay, so that's going to go in the oven. So one thing I just want to say is about um, omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, so Michelle was talking about that fat that helps keep uh, the texture um, and uh, the fish moist, especially if people have dry mouth. Um, but omega-3 fatty acids are really important because those it's um, an anti-inflammatory property, right? So we know that cancer is an inflammatory disease. Um, and so you want to have foods that are anti-inflammatory. And omega-3 is a great option. Now, omega-3 fatty acids are not made in our body. So we need to get them through food. Um, and this is where having fish that are high in fat, like salmon, trout, sardines, um, cod, are really important to have at least two to three times a week. If you're someone who doesn't like fish, all good. You can always take a pill supplement, a fish oil. Um, so that's your option. <laughs> all right. All right. So this is it done. Did one ahead of time um, in the parchment. And so what I'm going to do is I'll get my knife and we'll tear it open. And... 
So what's really nice is, again, I can see fish is cooked. We'll test that by, you know, just see if it flakes easily, which this does, which is perfect. Um, the veg is nice and soft and it's cooked. And there's some nice moisture in there, too, that came off the veg, which we'll keep to add to the puree to help it puree. And that'll add some flavor. But most importantly, like I mentioned, there's no browning on top. OK, so this is going to puree much easier than if I were to get a char or you know, any crust over there. Um, so this would be the regular plate and you can top it with some nice pesto. Beautiful. You know, that's how you would serve it. Now we're going to take this to the minced stage. OK. So, and Jeremy, I had a couple yeah. questions. Yes. Can they also cook this in a casserole dish with a lid if they don't have the parchment paper? Yes, great question. So you can definitely do this in a dish with a lid, or if you, even if you don't have a lid, just cover the dish with some foil, um, and you can do it that way. Absolutely. You just you just want to sort of trap it from any direct heat that would create that charring, but that would work as well. Yes. Great. And when you're checking the fish, I think a lot of times people often overcook fish, and they might be worried that they're going to undercook it as well. Is there a way they can check? Because often we overcook, it gets you know a little drier. Yeah, so, and, and it's a great question because everyone's oven is going to be a little bit different as well. So what I would say is always, you're going to do it once to sort of test it out, to figure it out. Um, always check at the lower end. Um, so check at that 10-minute mark to see if it flakes apart easily. Um, once you start to see a lot of the white protein coming through, um, I don't know if you've ever, you know, cooked fish before and you see sort of those, like the white, almost like white foam on the on the outside. Uh, that's the proteins in, inside, and, and it's overcooking at that point. Okay. So check early, and then if you have to return it to the oven for a couple minutes, you know you can recover it and, and do that. Um, but that's a great point. You don't want to overcook it for sure. All right, so I have some of the veg here. I've taken it off, and some of the fish as well. And what we want to do to make sure that We've cooked it enough uh, for for mince processing and for puree processing as well. I know it's a little far. What I'm going to do is take my knife and I'm going to I'm going to try to mash through it. And if it mashes and separates really easily, then I know I've cooked it enough. So you can see I've, I've worked through that a little bit, and that's a little hard to see. But it it, it what we want to do is make sure that it's it'll fit through the spaces in a fork, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we're following the minced diet, we want to make sure that the pieces that are there are no more than four millimeters each, and that's about equivalent to the space in between the fork. So that's how we're going to test it later to make sure that it's meeting the minced uh, requirements. Now, I am doing this with a fork with a smaller piece, but you can definitely do this with a food processor as well. Um, and I would just sort of lightly pulse it in there until you get sort of the same size. Um, but you can see, I mean, it you know, takes like not even 20 seconds to work through this little piece here. And again, making sure that the pieces are small enough to fit through the spaces of your fork. And if you need to add a little bit of moisture to help, you can do that you know, from either the juices from the parchment package or just add a little bit of stock or like Michelle mentioned before, you can even add a little bit more fat and, and olive mm -hmm. oil. Yeah, adding some cooking oil can be helpful if you do need to gain weight or you're having trouble maintaining weight. That's a way to add it to vegetables or your meat, such as uh, olive oil or safflower oil. That could be a way to add a bit more calories to your meal. And it's so I guess with the fish, you can flake it pretty easily. But if you were doing a minced meat, you would have to use the food processor. Yeah, the food processor would just be a lot easier. And I'm going to show you the food processor in a second. Um, but what I'm doing here is now just doing the same thing with the fish and I'm working through the vegetables. Um, and again, it's nice and soft. It's breaking up really easily with the uh, fork here. And again, you just want to make sure that it's small enough to fit through the tines. We call it the tines. I don't know. Do you guys call it the tines? Tines of a fork or the spaces of a fork? <laughs> I don't I don't use that fancy of a word for it, but now I know what it is. <laughs> I, may, I may have made it up. Someone will fact check me. I may have made it up. We'll see. And I just want to um, add, you know, sometimes with like minced textures sometimes um, or even puree, you know, 
your your the way that you're incorporating those vegetables are in a different form, right? So it might take some getting used to um, and some trial and error onto you know what feels right for you. Um, but just an add on here, you know, you're still able to get the antioxidants and those phytonutrients from the different colors in vegetables and fruit. Um, so here we're getting those bright red, those bright orange. So we're getting more vitamin A from the orange. We're getting some um, lycopene and some vitamin C from those red peppers. Um, so just kind of remembering that you still are able to eat the color of the rainbow um, as you, you know, transition into perhaps a new texture uh, of the diet that you're experiencing. Okay, so I've minced this to the texture that we need it to be safe for mince compliant. Um, let me see if I can get you, you know what, I'll put it up to the screen just to get it a little bit closer. So I'm just going to review what the requirements are for a mince diet as we look at that. Uh, so as we mentioned, we need the pieces to be no more than the four millimeters. But the goal is also to have it soft and moist. We don't want any liquids leaking or dripping from the foods. It's basically, we don't want to have, like biting is not required for this texture. Uh, minimal chewing is required. And we need to make sure um, that there's not a lot of lumps in it. And if they are, they're small enough that they can be mashed with the tongue. And food can be easily mashed with just a little bit of pressure from the fork. So you saw Jeremy do that as he was going through the vegetables and the fish as well. And you should be able to also scoop it onto a fork with no liquid or crumbling uh, crumbles of food coming off of the fork as well. And then we're going to show the spoon test, I think, as well to make sure the food is not too sticky. So you'll see that a bit later for both our minced and our pureed foods. Yes. All right. So there's the texture for the mince and what we can do after that, so I'm going to plate it real quickly. Um, you know, and these are nice techniques to, to, you know, make it a little bit more pleasing, um, more appetizing, even though it's in a smaller texture, it doesn't have to look, you know, non-appetizing. So what you can do is get these like little molds, little ring molds. Um, I've even made them with like foil. You can kind of just like, you know, shape it around a cup um, and then use that mold. And then what you can do is like fill it in. And I don't know if you guys can see that well, but we put the vegetables on the bottom, a little bit of that minced salmon on top. And then we're gonna do our, our dressing, our pesto dressing in a second. But you can see already, like it looks a lot more appetizing versus if mm -hmm. we just sort of piled it on a plate separately. Right. Yeah. So you can even just kind of use the uh, cookie cutters you have at home or buy these at the local store. Uh, so I think this is great because we really do eat with our eyes. And especially when we have to change the texture, it's even more important to use different colors of foods and contrasting them on the plate. And also the way we shape it is helpful as well. And this is going to help enhance appetite um, with this kind of food and meal, especially in the beginning stages when someone's transitioning over to a new texture of food and even if you go on Amazon they have specialized food molds that you know look like carrots or look like the chicken so you can use those to even make them look a little bit more uh, like the original food using your minced and pureed foods yes perfect um, and so the last thing here so we have our veg we have our salmon or our trout on top and then for our sauce um, for our regular what we did was we just had a pesto and you can make one from scratch. You can have the store-bought pesto. Um, but the issue with some of these pestos, even if they're store-bought, is sometimes, I think Michelle was saying, they can come out too thick, right? They can come way too hard. And then sometimes they can come out a little too loose, and you're going to see a lot of separation between the basil, the herbs, and the oil, which can be an issue. So a way that we can make it um, a little more consistent so that it's mince compliant and puree compliant is we're going to puree this through with um, an avocado. Um, and that's going to help to sort of pull everything in place. Um, and then we can make sure that there's no separation uh, from that oil and from that herb. So we're going to add this avocado puree with this. And you can do this in a blender food processor. Um, and we're going to get it to a nice consistency where it's spoonable but that it falls off the spoon as well. And we're going to show you that test again in a second with the purees, but you can see it's nice and spoonable. And I'm going to add just a nice little bit on top. 
and there's our mints. Compliant dish, beautiful. And then for the purees, we're going to get our food processor out because we do want this pureed now. And I'm going to change the angle here. Can you see the food processor a little bit in the back? Yes, we can see it. All right. Yeah. I'm kind of constricted by the length of the plug, but I think we'll be okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is add that piece of fish. And I'll just break it up by hand at the beginning just to make it a little bit easier, a little bit smaller pieces in here. Okay. And if it's very, very moist, then you probably don't have to add any extra liquid. You can kind of tell the first couple times you pulse it up. But then if you do have to add a little bit, again, you can add olive oil, you can add a little bit of stock or water, or if you do have some of that cooking juice left in the parchment paper or baking dish or wherever you're baking it in, we can add a little bit of that as well. Now it's important not to add too much liquid at the beginning because we don't want to make the soupy, right? This, this should still hold its shape. All right, so I'm gonna pulse this through. Maybe I'll turn my mic off. That way I don't blow everyone's ear. Michelle, I know that there was something that you wanted me to ask. I closed down all my windows. <laughs> Did That's you okay. I just wanted to review some of the signs of difficulty chewing and swallowing because yeah. some people might not know what to look out for. So those things include if you're coughing or choking when you're eating or drinking. Um, if you feel like food is getting stuck in your throat frequently as you're eating, this can be a sign that there's difficulty swallowing. If you're holding food in your mouth for longer and it's hard to bring it to the back of your throat, this can be a sign. Or if you're having a really gurgly voice after eating or noticing a lot of excessive throat throat clearing while eating or drinking or just after eating or drinking. And so these things are all important to mention to your doctor because they do need to be assessed further. As we mentioned, you know, it is, uh, you know, it, it can have some serious side effects if we're not matching the kind of diet texture we need to make our swallowing safer. So you should let your doctor know and your doctor can send a referral to the speech language pathologist and they're healthcare professionals that specialize in managing swallowing disorders and they provide specific recommendations to individuals to help them have safer swallowing and as well also getting a referral to the dietitian like Stephanie or I <laughs> and this is because when someone has difficulty swallowing it can be harder to get um, all of your nutrients or eat as much as you used to so we want to make sure you're getting enough of the nutrition as well and teaching you how to follow the diet as well yeah yeah I know that sometimes you know people wish that they could have like you know crunchy things or different tastes and textures and you know it's really about safety and you know I know that um, a lot of times you know even um, if someone's experiencing um, GI issues right where they have to kind of have less vegetables or fruit mm -hmm. Etc. But, you know, then they say, but I need, you know, like everybody's telling me that, you know, healthy eating includes like lots of vegetables. And, you know, I just always like to reiterate the fact that you still can get those, um, you know, nutrients in. It's just in a different way and looking at it in maybe a different creative way and uh, spinning um, how you used to do it in a safe way for your own swallowing. No. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, he's all fished. <laughs> Maybe Nat, our tech superhuman. There we go. You're unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So what we want to do is essentially we're making a moose with this salmon or the trout and again we want to puree until it's really nice and smooth we don't want any chunks or any solid pieces in there as well um, and what we can do to test for this just to make sure it's the right consistency um we call it the spoon tilt test michelle does that i know that at yes. school we call it the spoon tilt yeah okay so <laughs> what, we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a nice little mound of it on our spoon here like this, and we're gonna tilt it and should hold its shape, right? 
Yes, so we don't want any like dripping over the spoon, but as we turn it, we want to make sure it kind of plops right off the spoon and we're not getting a lot of leftover um, food staying on the spoon. So this means that it's not too sticky, right? We'll make sure we can move it around in our mouth, okay. Now, if you do find that it's, it's too firm, it's not coming off the spoon like it is here and it's sticking, then you would just want to introduce some more liquid, some more oil, some more fat, and then process it again, just until you get to this state. Um, and then the same thing, if it's not mounding like Michelle mentioned and it's sort of falling off, um, then you kind of have to adjust. So hopefully you have a little bit more fish or you can introduce something, a vegetable that's cooked in starchy. So if I had some more leftover cooked carrots, I could put that in there and whip it up again with the carrots because that would help firm it up uh, or even some avocado as well. That would work. Or even okay, if so, you have some leftover sweet potatoes or something in your fridge yes. when you're making these. Yeah. Perfect. We like the addition of the avocado to bump up the calories, though, especially yeah. if you're needing more calories. Yeah. There you go. Um, and then the last thing here is like we've done the test. We know how it works. But sometimes with the food processor, um, with the blender, if you know you're doing this manually at home, you might miss a couple little pieces here and there. So what we do is, you know, we'd say when in doubt, strain it out. Um, and what you can do is you can get a sieve. This is like a little mesh sieve. You can find these at, you know, most grocery stores or like food surplus stores. You can probably even order them on Amazon. Um, and make sure you get the fine mesh ones. Um, that way we try to remove as many of the particles as possible. And what we're going to do is just pass it through this sieve. So that way, just in case we missed any larger chunks, we know that we can catch those through the sieve. And this will actually help to puree it to an even smoother consistency by passing it through here. So this is commonly done in restaurants. If you want like a super, super smooth um, sauce or puree, you're going to pass it through either a sieve or, or a tammy is another like just really fine mesh sieve. All right. And you can use either a spatula or a spoon. And we're just going to run it through the sieve. And yes, this takes a little bit of extra work, but it's it shouldn't be too much. And the idea is that we, we do want to make sure that we, we are getting it really nice and smooth. All right, and I can see it's it's coming through nicely on the other side. All right, and we're just going to, again, push it through with your spatula or your sieve until you get it mostly through. And if there's a lot of particles left behind, then you can also run those through your food processor again or your blender again. And so, yeah. The goal of this is just to get rid of some of the larger particles that haven't uh, broken up in the blender. We shouldn't be using any fish that have bones or gristle or meat that has um, like cartilage in it before putting it in the blender. Right, Jeremy? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And again, you know, even if you buy something that will have it removed, it's not always guaranteed. So this is, again, this is just another way to catch it just in case. All right, so now we're going to plate, and I guess I can use the same ring here. And I've done the same thing with our vegetables. So pureed them to their nice smooth consistency. We'll do that spoon tilt test. Comes off, mounds nicely, comes off the spoon really easily. <laughs> And so we'll plate, right? And again, this obviously the plating and you, you know getting chefy doesn't have to happen every time, but I think it does make a big difference, especially when you're working with textures where the appearances aren't you know what you're used to. And I think you can also kind of play around, maybe have a little fun when it comes to plating these things. Uh, you could choose to put the vegetables on top sometimes or maybe on the side if you want to see the two different colors on your plate. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But usually we need some kind of sauce on the meat or sauce on the vegetables as well. All right, so we'll put that on there. 
and then again finishing with our avocado pesto sauce and again you know just doing a quick a quick little test this comes off and again if it's seized up a little bit just introduce a little bit more liquid in there and we'll put a little bit of that sauce and there we go shows you your our regular and then here's our mince and here's our puree right right and then again just to mention quickly um like michelle was saying before we don't want any separation which sometimes you can get from vegetables because of the water content so again you can see on the plate that there is no liquid separation there um in the case that you do you can always run those through like even a little bit of starch that helps um like uh even a little bit of cornstarch it'll help to kind of pull some of that excess uh, moisture in okay Great. there we go Great.